Good afternoon and welcome. In today's lecture, we're going to cover the following types of objectives. Students at the end of the lecture should be able to describe how the size, shape, and chemical nature of a drug affects its pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic properties. To explain how the presence of an asymmetric carbon affects a drug's pharmacologic action. To describe important differences between an agonist and a competitive pharmacologic antagonist that bind to the same receptor. To compare and contrast common routes of drug administration. Students should be able to name and define the two processes that allow a drug to travel from its site of administration to its site of action. Explain why a hydrophobic drug is more likely than a hydrophilic drug to rely upon metabolism for elimination. Students should be able to outline the system of drug regulation and the process of approval of new drugs in the U.S., uh, which was a topic we had discussed on the board uh, during uh, Chapter 1 lecture material, and to explain the difference between a generic and a proprietary drug. Some of the words to pay attention to in Chapter 1 are listed for you here. Uh, many of these we've already discussed. Many of them are on your um, uh, review sheet for Chapter 1. Uh, but if you look down these lists and you see something that's um, not making sense, uh, please make sure to uh, pay attention to the rest of this lecture and or uh, to consult your textbook um, for certain uh, terms. Now, we spent some time on the board defining pharmacology as an experimental science, um, and uh, indeed it is. Uh, and our book uh, has put forth the definition that pharmacology is the study of substances that interact with living systems through chemical processes. Uh, and again, we had talked about the fact that, you know, we can define pharmacology in several ways, uh, but the way we had discussed it on the board uh, as an experimental science that has for its purpose the study of changes brought about in living systems by chemically acting substances, whether for therapeutic purposes or not. And we spent a lot of time talking about kind of the pros and cons of that definition. Uh, but here is just um, kind of a more uh, typical definition of pharmacology, which uh, de-emphasizes the experimental science, uh, but does bring to light the fact that there is an interaction uh, of a substance with a living system, uh, particularly through, um, through a receptor. And so we'll spend some time in the second lecture talking about the natures of receptors. In terms of the nature of these chemically acting substances, uh, these are usually going to be uh, some kind of chemical that's administered uh, with a therapeutic purpose. And of course, um, it's, it's not typical uh, for a chemical with a therapeutic purpose to uh, strictly have uh, therapeutic action. Uh, rather, it's quite um, typical for a drug to also have, um, aside from its intended action, unintended actions or adverse uh, effects. So uh, along the lines of pharmacology, we can further distinguish um, terms such as medical pharmacology, uh, which is going to be the science of substances used to prevent, diagnose, and treat diseases, as well as toxicology, which is really just an extension of pharmacology, and its main focus is understanding undesirable effects of chemicals on living systems. And those living systems can range from individual cells all the way up to complex ecosystems. All right, so we've spent some time talking about definitions. Uh, we've talked about pharmacology as being able to be defined a couple ways. Um, and the preferred definition that I've tried to convince you is the preferred definition, uh, includes that of the experimental science and includes that of therapeutic purposes or not, where the or not can be an opportunity, um, not just uh, always a, an unfortunate adverse effect. 
Okay, so think back to what we talked about on the board. And uh, for example, we had talked about the drug thalidomide in this way. Now a drug in its most general sense is a substance that brings about a change in biologic function through its chemical action. In the majority of cases, this drug is going to interact with a specific molecule in that biologic system. And that molecule is known as a receptor molecule and often plays a regulatory role. So most drugs work by interacting with receptors and that interaction causes a a conformational change or a biophysical change in the receptor uh, that may initiate a, a you know a complex series of events or or may just be a, a, a short series of events but nonetheless a pharmacologic effect is seen now in a very small number of cases uh, in particular the chemical antagonist we can see a drug interacting with another drug and not at a receptor. Okay, so drug A is working at receptor A, drug B comes along, binds to drug A, prevents it from interacting with receptor A. And lastly, uh, there are a few drugs that interact um, exclusively with water molecules, uh, and these drugs would fall into the class called osmotic agents, where they don't really bind to any kind of macromolecule, but rather pull water out of the body um, through their osmotic effect. Now, not all diuretics, by the way, are osmotic agents, but all osmotic agents would be considered uh, diuretics. To broaden our discussion of drugs, therefore, drugs uh, can be one of many different things. It could be something that your body normally synthesizes, like a hormone, that now your body's deficient in making, maybe due to a disease state. Uh, so maybe there's, um, there's a disease of the adrenal gland and the adrenal gland's not making cortisol. Uh, or maybe there's a disease of the pancreas and the pancreas is deficient in making insulin. And so just giving back that hormone is sufficient in restoring function. On the other hand, many drugs are considered to be xenobiotic. Xeno is a Greek prefix that means strange or foreign, something that's foreign to the body, xenobiotics. So something that your body doesn't synthesize would be considered a xenobiotic. Poisons are drugs in some instances uh, where the toxins are usually defined as poisons of biologic origin synthesized by plants or animals. Okay, so a toxin like uh, botulinum toxin synthesized by a bacteria in that, uh, uh, in that instance. Um, but nonetheless, it's, it's something made in nature. So a toxin would be considered uh, a toxic compound synthesized by an organism, like a bacteria or like a snake or like a scorpion, uh, as opposed to inorganic poison, something like metal, like lead, or something like arsenic would be considered inorganic poison. So you might say, well, how can poisons be drugs? Well, most chemo drugs are poisons that kill tumor cells and unfortunately also kill healthy cells. So in some regard or in some situations, I should say, poisons are used as drugs to achieve an endpoint. So in order for a drug to interact with its receptor, it's got to be the right size, shape, electrical charge, and atomic composition. And all of these factors are going to impact how the drug interacts with the receptor. And so realize that most drugs, or I'd say usually what happens is a drug is administered at a distant location from where its intended site of action is. So for example, you might have a headache, right? And you may take an aspirin, but you're taking the aspirin orally to relieve the headache, right? So that aspirin has to be able to move from your digestive tract into your systemic circulation up to the blood vessels in your, in your head. 
right? So it has to have the necessary properties to be able to move and to get to its target site. And lastly, that drug is going to be inactivated or excreted from the body, okay? And so, therefore, it's, it's going to have a limited duration of action because the body is going to do something to it. It's going to start to process and eliminate that drug. And so when it comes to the physical nature of drugs, at room temperature, drugs can be solids, they can be liquids, they can be gases. And solids are quite common uh, in our experience, in aspirin, um, many types of drugs taken orally as tablets. Um, liquids, you may consider uh, ethanol as a drug. It used to be used even as an anesthetic uh, many, many years ago, for example, during the Civil War. Um, it's a liquid and certain um, drugs exist as gases like nitrous oxide, also known as the laughing gas or sometimes um, um, also known as just uh, uh, the gas that's useful in the dentist's office uh, for um, dental procedures, right? And so physical state may influence the best rate, the best route of administration. So if something's a gas, um, it may be administered through inhalation compared to something's a solid, which may be administered through oral administration. So when it comes to drug administration, uh, there are many routes, many potential routes that can be used. Some of these routes are very familiar to us, like the oral route. And it makes sense for us uh, to think of a patient taking something by mouth. And in addition to the oral route, uh, we have the rectal route, and the other orifice of the body. And both um, the mouth and the rectum are part of the GI tract, right? One represents the beginning of the GI tract. The rectum obviously represents the end of the GI tract. And so both of these routes of administration would be considered enteric, enteric referring to the gut, the gut of the animal, right? So oral, rectal would be two different types of enteric administration. While all these other routes you see listed here, intravenous, intramuscular, subcutaneous, inhalation, transdermal, these would all be outside of the gut, outside of the gut. And another word for outside of the gut Parenteral, parenteral, P A R, paren, and I'm not going to keep spelling this whole thing, but parenteral, etc. Oh, I just spelled the word parent. <laughs> That's interesting, though. So let me just finish spelling parenteral. And that's a really bad way of writing that. But um, parenteral would represent um, outside of the gut. The prefix para meaning outside of. All right. Uh, well, I really spelled parenteral wrong. Parenteral. Oh, parenteral. And, of course, you see enter here, meaning gut, enteric. So parenteral outside of the gut, I think, I think you got it. <laughs> um, so um, the physical nature of drugs is an important part of the drug because it may lend itself to certain routes of administration compared to others. Um, also, there are many, many different types of organic structures um, uh, that can be useful or that are used by drugs to achieve their binding to receptors. And so we see carbohydrate drugs, protein drugs, lipid drugs, or drugs that or a little bit of each. Uh, many drugs happen to be ionizable and can be considered weak acids or weak bases, which has important implications because pH differences in the various body compartments um, can, can alter the degree of ionization, right? So uh, if a weak acid is, is ionized in the urine, but, you know, that, that might be good for excretion, but it may be actually uh, non-ionized or neutral, uh, as it enters the small intestine, as it leaves the stomach. Okay, so 
we'll talk a little more about you know ionization, weak acids, weak bases, and 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 the effect of that on drug absorption and excretion as we go on uh, today. But the next topic in our chapter deals with the size of drugs. Now, molecular size of drugs can vary from very small to very large. An example of a very small drug would be lithium. All right, lithium has a molecular weight that comes in around seven, right, seven times the size of a hydrogen atom, while a very large protein drug, clot-busting drug, alteplase, this thing is on the order of 59,000 times the size of a hydrogen atom. Okay, so we get a very wide range of sizes, which has implications in terms of movement throughout the body, in terms of receptor binding. Note that the vast majority of drugs are actually um, about 100 to 1,000 times the size of hydrogen. Okay, but in order to have a good fit, only one type of receptor, uh, well, fit to one type of receptor, a drug must be sufficiently unique in its shape and in its charge. Okay, and uh, so the size of a drug, therefore, is going to be important in terms of how it binds to its receptor. Here's a figure uh, that kind of puts uh, a few drugs uh, together in terms of their size. Uh, if you're to look over here uh, on the left, we see lithium coming in at about seven times the size of a hydrogen atom. Uh, sodium would obviously be a little bit larger than lithium if you look down the periodic chart. Uh, and then we can see things like glucose or epinephrine or aspirin uh, coming in between uh, 100 times the size of hydrogen to 1,000 times the size of hydrogen. And then we get into larger drugs like vancomycin, which is an antibiotic, uh, or insulin, which is a peptide drug. Uh, also, uh, uh, Herceptin, which is a type of um, antibody drug used to treat uh, breast cancer. Here we have very large drugs, and very large drugs uh, have a difficult time moving around the body, and they tend to tend to require routes of administration that put them right into the circulation. Uh, so oftentimes we're talking about parenteral um, uh, routes. Okay, so just as an example of some of the various sizes of drugs and such. So how do drugs interact with their receptors? Well, there's a few ways. Um, we can think of these interactions in terms of forces or bonds that form between drug and receptor. The strongest of all the forces are the covalent forces. And this represents uh, not what usually is going on between drug and receptor, because covalent bonds are very strong and they're generally not reversible unless there's some enzyme that can somehow be used to reverse them, All right? So covalent bonds, very strong uh, force that um, mediates bonding between a drug and a receptor. One example of a covalently bound drug receptor complex is phenoxybenzamine and the alpha adrenergic receptor. Right, phenoxybenzamine actually forms a covalent bond with that receptor, and therefore its effect is long-lasting at the receptor. Right, there's no competition, there's no falling off or dissociating. Uh, we could basically say that the dissociation constant uh, is infinity because uh, the covalently bound drug does not dissociate with its receptor. So this is the strongest of all forces. Uh, next, we'll discuss electrostatic forces. Okay, and in electrostatic forces, uh, we basically see strong linkages between permanently charged ionic bonds. Okay, so uh, in electrostatic forces, you might have a positively charged residue of a drug interacting with a negatively charged residue of the receptor, right, in an ionic way. And um, in addition to this, then move forward here. Uh, we can then talk about um, hydrogen bonding and dipole, induced dipole interactions, such as Van der Waals forces. Uh, 
all of these would kind of fall under the uh, electrostatic bonding and are weaker than covalent bonds, but still uh, are stronger than no interaction, right? So we consider these weaker than covalent bonds, but definitely stronger than, you know, though there's no interaction at all. And lastly, are the hydrophobic forces. These are quite weak. Uh, they're probably important in the interactions of highly lipid soluble drugs with the lipids of cell membranes, uh, and perhaps in the interaction of drugs with the internal walls of receptor pockets. Okay, so if you go back over this, uh, with the strongest of all forces are the covalent forces, are right, followed by electrostatic forces, uh, which include those of full positive and full negative charge, or uh, the weaker hydrogen bond, or the much weaker van der Waals forces, and lastly, the hydrophobic forces. Okay, so the shape of the drug must be such as to permit binding to a receptor. And under optimal conditions, the drug's shape will be complementary to that of the receptor. Okay, so it's going to fit into the receptor just like a key would fit into a lock. And one important phenomenon that can affect drug binding and affect drug shape is the phenomenon of chirality. And this is very common in biology. In fact, more than half of all useful drugs uh, are chiral molecules and exist as N enantiomeric pairs. And of course, we have drugs that have more than one asymmetric carbon. Drugs, for example, have two asymmetric centers, have four diastereomers, like a drug like labetalol, for example, which is a drug that's useful in reducing blood pressure. So chiral refers to a molecule with a center of three-dimensional asymmetry. Many drugs, over 50% of all drugs, are going to be considered chiral and exist as enantiomeric pairs. Now, the problem with this is that these um, enantiomers can't be superimposed on each other. Okay, so... While they may be atomically identical, right, they're not pharmacologically identical because their, their shape is altered due to the way uh, that the carbons come together in that, in that stereoisomer. Now, chirality has traditionally been distinguished by the direction in which a purified enantiomer will rotate light. Will it rotate polarized light either dextro or levo, right? Dextro meaning positive direction, or levo meaning the minus direction. Okay, and so um, many enantiomers are going to be designated as the L isomer or the D isomer. Uh, and usually only one of those isomers has pharmacologic efficacy. If you look at this slide, you'll see a, a diagrammatic sketch of a receptor binding pocket, and hopefully you're seeing me draw it around that right now, right? And that's depicted here as this parallelogram. It has these hypothetical binding sites of the alpha binding site, of the beta binding site, and of the gamma binding site. And what you can see here is we have a molecule, and that molecule has four different substituents. We have a hydrogen, we have a an alpha group, a beta group, and a gamma group. Gamma group coming out at us towards the front of the plane. And if you look at the structure here on the left, you see that the alpha site of the receptor matches the alpha site of the drug. The beta site of the receptor matches the beta site of the drug. And the gamma site of the receptor matches the gamma site of the drug. And so in this particular isomer, we have a good fit with the receptor. How about when we look over at this isomer? Do we see a problem? What's the problem? The gamma group in the drug is in the wrong orientation, right? So this particular drug, right, this particular drug right here, is not going to fit well into the receptor binding site. 
And how about this drug? Way out on the end. This drug is not able to fit as well because there is no gamma site at all. In fact, this drug on the end is not a chiral compound, right? Because it's only got three different substituents on the carbon. So this idea of, of isomers, stereoisomers, is important because oftentimes only one of the forms fits into the active site of the receptor. So, in a great majority of cases, one of the enantiomers of a chiral racemic mixture will be much more potent than its mirror image. And so our book gives us some examples. For example, the S enantiomer of methacholine, the plus enantiomer. It's a parasympathetic-like drug. We'll mention this drug again uh, in Chapter 7 of our textbook. But as you can see, the plus enantiomer is almost 250 times more potent than the minus enantiomer. Okay, so here's a, a concrete example of the difference in potency. And there are other examples as well. So, for example, if we look at carvitolol, carvitolol is a drug used to reduce hypertension. <laughs> and it's an interesting drug. It has a single chiral center, so it has two enantiomers the S minus enantiomer and the R plus enantiomer. And if we look at the pharmacology of the enantiomers, uh, the S enantiomer is a potent beta receptor blocker, while the R is about a hundredfold less active at the beta receptor. Right? So the S enantiomer of carvitolol, a much more potent beta blocker uh, than, than the R enantiomer, However, and this slide got cut off a little bit, but the two isomers have equal um, inhibitory action at the alpha receptor. Okay, so here, while one enantiomer is more potent than the other at beta receptors, uh, there is no difference in potency uh, at the alpha receptors, and that part got cut off of your slide here. Third example our book talks about is ketamine. Now, ketamine is an intravenous anesthetic where the positive enantiomer is a more potent anesthetic and less toxic than the negative enantiomer, than the levoform, the L enantiomer. However, the drug is used as a racemic mixture. Why is that? Well, because ketamine has been used for many, many years, and to separate enantiomers is an expensive task. And so one school of thought is if the racemic mixture works, and it works effectively, uh, then why add more cost onto the separation, right? So ketamine, and the third example of where you have enantiomers that differ in their potency, but in practice, the ketamine example uh, is never really felt because the drug is just dispensed as a racemic mixture. And let us not forget that the enzymes themselves are usually stereospecific, right? So one drug enantiomer is often more susceptible than the other to drug metabolizing enzymes. And therefore, the duration of action of one enantiomer might be different from that of another. Okay, so that's also uh, an important thing to consider, the shape. Remember, in all of these things, we're talking about the shape, the shape of the drug and how it fits into its receptor. Now, um, the next part of your textbook talks to you about rational design of drugs or rational drug design, as well as receptor nomenclature. And um, you can read these two slides I've prepared for you, but I'm not going to um, really focus on them, uh, particularly because many of you have already had a class in medicinal chemistry. That leads us to the next topic. And that is the topic of drug-body interaction. And so the interactions between a drug and the body can be divided into two general classes. The first class are the pharmacodynamic processes, the actions of the drug on the body. And these properties determine the group in which a drug is classified. For example, the drug is antihypertensive or a drug is antidepressant, or a drug is anti-inflammation, 
And we think about it, what the drug's doing to the body. On the other hand, we have to realize that the body is also going to do something to the drug. And so this field is called pharmacokinetics. What is the body doing to the drug? Okay, the body's absorbing the drug. The body's allowing the drug to move throughout itself, to distribute into tissues. The body's eliminating the drug. And so these pharmacokinetic processes are very important, particularly in patients who might have um, disease, disease of the kidney or disease of the liver or disease of the GI tract. Okay, so pharmacokinetics becomes a whole chapter in our textbook uh, where we talk about some of these um, things in more detail. Back to pharmacodynamics. So in the world of pharmacodynamics, we have drugs which would be considered agonist drugs. And these are drugs which bind to and activate a receptor in some way, which directly or indirectly brings about an effect. Remember, we talked about a chain of events. And how long is the links of the chain? Is it a single link? Is it multiple links? But neither here nor there, there's going to be an effect that occurs because of the drug binding to and activating the receptor. And so we say that some receptors incorporate effector machinery in the same molecule so that when the drug binds, the effect is directly occurring, right? The effector machinery, for example, in the case of an ion channel would be a drug binding to that receptor and the channel in return immediately opening and letting an ion pass into the cell, right? So some receptors incorporate effector machinery in the same molecule. Other receptors are linked through one or more intervening coupling molecules to a separate effector molecule. So the second part written for you here in green is talking about receptors that, you know, a drug will bind, there'll be a conformation change, but then there'll be a series of steps that happen before an effect is achieved. Okay, and so those, <laughs> those steps can be considered coupling molecules, and then the response is going to be carried out by an effector molecule. On the other hand, antagonist drugs will bind to a receptor and prevent binding by other molecules. So they'll bind to a receptor, but they will not activate that receptor. An example of this would be blockers of the acetylcholine receptor, such as atropine. Okay, which is an antagonist because it prevents access of acetylcholine or similar compound to access and activate the acetylcholine receptor. Antagonists like atropine reduce the effect of acetylcholine and similar drugs in the body. Now, some drugs mimic agonist drugs in an indirect way. So in this case, they inhibit the molecule that's responsible for terminating the action of the endogenous agonist. What does he mean by that? Inhibiting the molecule responsible for terminating the action of the endogenous agonist. Well, if we look at this enzyme here, acetylcholinesterase, acetylcholinesterase, ACE means enzyme, ester means enzyme that cleaves ester bonds. Which ester bonds? The one that's in acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is what we call a choline ester. So acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, by inhibiting the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine, leaves more acetylcholine in, around than there otherwise would be. And that causes what we call a cholinomimetic effect that closely resembles the actions of cholinoceptor agonists. Okay, so even though the cholinesterase inhibitor does not bind to the cholinoceptor, it stimulates the cholinoceptor indirectly by keeping acetylcholine around when it otherwise would have been degraded. Other drugs bind to receptors and activate them, but do not evoke as great a response as the full agonist. And so this leads us to a discussion of partial agonists. 
One example of which is pindolol. Pindolol is a beta receptor partial agonist. And because it's a partial agonist, depending on the, set, the situation, we can see different effects. It can act either as an agonist or as an antagonist. If there is no full agonist around and you give a patient pindolol, then the compound is acting as an agonist, partial agonist. On the other hand, if you give a patient pindolol and there is full agonist around, like isopyranol, for example, well, if that's a full agonist and we're placing it with pindolol, which is a partial agonist, we're actually acting as if the compound is an antagonist, right? Reducing, we talked about this in class, muting the trombone, right? Reducing the full signal of the agonist with a partial agonist. So if this is causing you any question or confusion, just realize that we have this, this other class, right? We have full agonist, we have antagonist, and now we have partial agonist. And partial agonist will give you a less than maximum signal compared to a full agonist, uh, and that's an important part of its property. So now, a drug has bound to a receptor. There's been a, a change in a biologic system, right? Something has happened, and so the cell or the tissue has responded. But then the next question is, well, how long does this drug effect last? What is its duration of action? And how does it stop? You know, how, do, how, does, how does the drug kind of uh, signal get turned off? And so there's a few answers to this question. In some cases, the effect of a drug will last only as long as the drug occupies the receptor. So that dissociation of the drug from the receptor automatically terminates the effect. So drug falls off the receptor, and the response stops. That's one possibility. Another possibility is um, that the action of a drug may persist even after the drug has dissociated. So the drug's fallen off, but the action is still there. Why? Well, usually it means that there's some coupling molecule that's been activated, and it's still present in its active form. Right, so maybe it's a G protein that's been activated, but it's still active, even though the drug has dissociated from the receptor. In the case of drugs that bind covalently to a receptor, the effect may persist until when? Well, forever, but not really. Right, that covalently bound receptor is going to stay in the membrane until the cell destroys it and makes a new receptor, which is not covalently bound, right? So usually what happens is that covalently modified receptor will be internalized and degraded <laughs> and replaced with a new receptor that's not bound by um, uh, irreversible antagonist. Lastly, many receptor effector systems, right, a receptor effector system is just another way of saying, you know, drug receptor complex that results in a change. So many of these systems incorporate desensitization mechanisms that prevent excessive activation when drug molecules continue to be present for extended periods of time. So another way of saying this is that um, in the prolonged stimulation of a drug, the tissue may become desensitized and stop responding to the signal. And in a later lecture, we kind of tackle that topic in more detail. Now, when it comes to drugs and receptors, that receptor, that endogenous molecule, must be selective in what it chooses to bind. And its selectivity is going to confer drug selectivity upon that receptor complex. Okay, so we don't, um, uh, we use the term promiscuous binding when we talk about an agent that binds to lots of things 
uh, non-selectively, but drugs bind to receptors in a selective manner. And remember, it must change its function, right, the function of the receptor upon binding so that a biologic system is altered. Right, so the drug binds to receptor, and there's a conformational change, and that conformational change is sensed by an effector. The effector might be the same molecule. The effector might be downstream and might need coupling molecules. But the function, or the re I really should say the response to binding results in the alteration of the biologic system. And that's clearly necessary if the ligand is to cause a pharmacologic effect. On the other hand, the body contains molecules that are capable of binding drugs, but yet no biochemical response is achieved. Right? So um, there are some what we would call non-regulatory molecules. For example, plasma albumin. Plasma albumin is a plasma protein. It's not linked to a cell response per se. It's a plasma protein. It floats around in the, in the plasma of the blood. Uh, and, and yet, it can bind to drugs. And so we call something like plasma albumin an inert binding site, right? an inert binding site. And the binding is significant because the drug that sits on the plasma albumin is bound and unable to enter into parenchymal tissues and act there. So if you're bound to albumin, you're not bound to a receptor. You can't be two places at once, right? So albumin is a type of non-regulatory molecule that can affect drug action. And we would call it an inert binding site because, yes, it can bind to a drug, but no, it's not changing some kind of biochemical pathway. It's just kind of sequestering the drug. It's holding the drug, holding it, letting it go. Binding of drug to albumin is happening in an equilibrium you know, kind of way, right? So this would be considered an inert binding site. There's no receptor per se that's being activated, but the binding is significant. Now, in therapeutics, the idea is that the drug should be able to reach its site of action after administration by some route. And usually... Applying a drug directly to the site it's needed is difficult and rare. Occasionally, you can topically, for example, apply something to your skin, uh, an anti-inflammatory, for example, that's being directly applied to inflamed skin, right? And then in that way, you're putting the drug right where it's needed. But in other cases, a drug must be given intravenously and circulate in the blood directly to get to the blood vessels and to get to the parts of the body where it will work in terms of having a useful effect, right? So I'll use the example of an antidepressant drug, right? That drug is working in the brain, but it may be taken by mouth. And so that drug may be given orally, but it's acting in the brain. So it has to be able to reach its destination. Okay, and how does it do that? through a process that involves pharmacokinetic parameters. And so the drug must be absorbed, right? It must get into the blood from its site of administration. The drug must be distributed to the site of action. It has to also be able to cross the various barriers it's going to encounter, such as cell membranes. And lastly, after bringing about its effect, the drug is going to be eliminated from the body through metabolic inactivation and excretion, usually into the urine or into the feces, right? So the drug is going to have to be absorbed. It's going to have to distribute to the site of action and get to where it needs to go. And once it's done its job, it's going to be eliminated through a process of metabolic inactivation and excretion into usually the urine and feces or urine or feces or a mixture of the two. Uh, occasionally through other... Uh, ways of elimination such as exhalation or through sweat, but usually through excretion into uh, the bile or into the urine. And so if we just take, you know, a very simple example of a drug given orally 
to have an effect in the CNS. That drug is going to have to pass some barriers, such as the tissues that comprise the wall of the intestine, the walls of the capillaries that perfuse the gut, and the blood-brain barrier, the walls of the capillaries that perfuse the brain, as a simple example. Now, the next topic that we have in front of us is the idea of drug permeation. Permeation means movement of something through a uh, environment, movement of something from one place to another. In pharmacology, drug permeation proceeds by one of four primary mechanisms. Aqueous diffusion, lipid diffusion, special carriers, or endo or exocytosis. So usually one of these four ways is how a drug moves through the body. The most common way of permeation is through passive diffusion in aqueous or lipid medium. Active processes that may, may require energy are going to play a role in the movement of many drugs, especially large drugs that are unable to diffuse easily. So aqueous diffusion. Aqueous diffusion occurs within the larger aqueous components of the body, such as the interstitial space, the cytosol, across epithelial membrane tight junctions, across endothelial lining of blood vessels, through aqueous pores. And those aqueous pores may permit passage of molecules as large as 20 to 30,000 times the size of a hydrogen atom. Now, diffusion, be it aqueous or lipid, is usually driven by the concentration gradient of the permeating drug and a relationship known as Fick's Law. Now, drug molecules that are bound to large plasma proteins like albumin are not able to permeate across aqueous pores. And if a drug is charged, its flux or movement may be influenced by electrical fields. So, for example, the membrane potential and in parts of the nephron, the transtubular potential may affect movement of the drug in water if it's charged. Lipid diffusion is the most important limiting factor for drug permeation because of the large number of lipid barriers that separate the different compartments of the body. And so in real terms, there is a, um, a constant known as the lipid aqueous partition coefficient, which is a useful parameter to know for a drug because it gives you an idea of the drug's tendency to dissolve either in lipid or water. Okay, the lipid aqueous partition coefficient. All right, in the case of, for example, weak acids and weak bases, which are able to change their uh, electrical status based on the pH of the system, the ability to move from aqueous to lipid media and vice versa varies with the pH because charged molecules attract water. All right, so this lipid aqueous partition coefficient is important for... Um, solubility of a particular drug across a membrane. So if we look at the cell membrane, we see that um, there's some interesting things there to consider. First of all, if we look here, we have these light blue colored spheres, which I've kind of highlighted there, which are the polar head groups of the phospholipid bilayer. All right, so there's our polar head groups. There's our hydrophobic tails coming down into the inner portion of the membrane. And so anything charged will have a difficult time trying to enter because it's going to hit that hydrophobic region and bounce out. Right? It's not going to be able to enter. Unless there's a transport protein, which I may circle here, right? or a pore or a channel that's going to let that charged substance into the cell. 
Okay, so um, if you have proteins that allow the transport of charged substances, those are called transport proteins, and you can see movement. But just going through the lipid membrane is not something that a charged species is able to do. Right, so if you look at this uh, lipid bilayer of the cell membrane, you see some interesting things. You see that there's a lot of lipid there, but there's also some pores. There's also some transmembrane-spanning proteins that can serve as transport proteins. So special carrier molecules is really what I'm talking about when I'm talking about these uh, transport proteins. And they exist for certain substances that are important for cell function and that are either too large or too insoluble in lipid to diffuse passively through the membrane. Things like peptides or amino acids or the very hydrophilic glucose would fall into this category. So these carriers bring about movement by active transport, also known as facilitated diffusion, and unlike passive diffusion, active transport is saturable and inhibitable, right? That's not true of passive diffusion, but is true of active transport. And so because many drugs are or resemble naturally occurring peptides, amino acids, or sugars, they can use these carriers oftentimes to enter into tissue. The last type of drug permeation I'll discuss is endo and exocytosis. A few substances are so large that they can enter cells only by endocytosis. And that's going to be the process by which the substance is engulfed by the cell membrane and carried into the cell by pinching off the newly formed vesicle inside the membrane. So the membrane actually circumscribes the substance that's going to be brought in and brings it in and picks off part of itself, pinches off part of itself, and that substance enters into the cytosol um, of the cell. The substance is then released inside the cytosol as that vesicle membrane breaks down. And if we look, this type of process of endocytosis is responsible for the transport of iron, for the transport of vitamin B12, that is each complex with appropriate binding proteins across the wall of the gut into the blood. Of course, exocytosis is what neurotransmitters, what happens to neurotransmitters when a signal comes down the axon and, uh, and the axon fires. And when it fires, it releases neurotransmitter through a process of exocytosis. Okay, so exocytosis is responsible for the secretion of many substances from cells, uh, in particular neurotransmitters, um, and they're often stored in membrane-bound vesicles and nerve endings to protect them from metabolic destruction. Fick's law of diffusion defines the relationship between the two concentration gradients, or I should say, between the two areas, that of high concentration and that of low concentration of a particular compound. So if you look in yellow, you can see this equation. Flux equals uh, the difference of the two areas in terms of concentration. We can call this difference the concentration gradient. So flux is directly proportional to the concentration gradient, the surface area of the barrier, and the lipid aqueous permeability coefficient. And flux is inversely proportional to the thickness of the barrier. So this is known as Fick's law of diffusion. In the case of lipid diffusion, the lipid aqueous partition coefficient is a major determinant of the mobility of the drug since it determines how readily the drug enters the lipid membrane from the aqueous medium. 
ionization of weak acids and weak bases and the henderson hasselbalch equation. So we have seen that the electrostatic charge of an ionized molecule, molecule attracts water dipole and results in polar, relatively water-soluble, and lipid-insoluble complexes. Since lipid diffusion depends on relatively high lipid solubility, ionization of drugs may markedly reduce their ability to permeate membranes. A very large fraction of drugs in use today are considered either weak acids or weak bases. And so let's define these terms. A weak acid is a neutral molecule, neutral molecule, that can reversibly dissociate into an anion and a proton. So if we look here at the weak acid, we have a neutral molecule, RH, dissociating into an anion and a proton. Okay, so the neutral molecule becomes charged. On the other hand, a weak base is defined as a neutral molecule that can form a cation, right? So it's a neutral molecule, right, that can become charged and form a cation. And it does so by combining with a proton. So our neutral molecule R combines with H plus to form the positively charged RH plus in this example. So the law of mass action requires that the reaction moves to the left in acidic environment, low pH, excess protons available, and move to the right in an alkaline environment. So that leads us to the henderson hasselbalch equation. And you, you may have seen it in different ways, but this is the way our textbook uh, describes it. Uh, and in some way, it's easy to remember. Right? The log of the concentration of the protonated form divided by the unprotonated form is equal to pKa minus pH. So the log of the protonated concentration over the unprotonated concentration is the difference of the pKa minus the pH. And this equation applies to both acidic and basic drugs. Now, you may have learned this equation slightly differently. You may have derived it slightly differently. But even if you were to use that equation, the one that you've derived elsewhere, it's going to work in this example. So again, the log of the concentration of P over the concentration of U, protonated over unprotonated, equals the pKa minus the pH. So if the compound is a weak acid and it's protonated, is that good for absorption or good for excretion if it's a weak acid and it's protonated? Very good. It's good for absorption. Okay. And so um, this equation applies to both acidic and basic drugs. Um, inspection confirms that the lower the pH relative to the pKa, the greater will be the fraction of drug in the protonated form. Because the uncharged form of a weak acid is the more lipid-soluble form, more of a weak acid will be lipid-soluble at acidic pH and more of a basic drug will be lipid soluble form at alkaline pH. So if we look at an example here um, of a weak acid, a neutral molecule that dissociates into an anion and a proton, and let's say that neutral molecule is aspirin. And it's an equilibrium with the aspirin anion and a proton. Well, um, if I go back, I'm, I'm going to have to re-record this whole thing. I don't know. So I'm going to talk to the aspirin example. Right? So in that equation prior, log of the concentration of protonated over the concentration of unprotonated equals pKa minus pH. Right. In that situation, if the pKa and the pH are equal, what's the ratio of protonated to unprotonated? Right. So look at the slide before on your on your handout. Right. If the pKa and the pH are equal, 
right? Where the pH is equal to the pKa. What is the ratio of protonated to unprotonated form of aspirin? Think about that. Now, the most important application of the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation is the manipulation of drug excretion by the kidney. Almost all drugs are filtered as a glomerulus. So if a drug is in a lipid-soluble form during its passage down the renal tubule, a significant fraction will be reabsorbed by simple passive diffusion. So if the goal is to accelerate excretion of the drug, it's important to prevent that reabsorption from the tubule, and that can often be accomplished simply by adjusting the urine pH to make sure that most of the drug is in the ionized state and excretable. So we call this a pH partitioning effect, where the drug is trapped in a compartment, and in this case, the compartment is the urine. So weak acids are usually excreted faster in alkaline urine, while weak bases are usually excreted faster in acidic urine. And if you look at chapter one, if you look at the case study that your book has given for you, it deals with this very issue. So I would encourage you to look at your book, chapter one, and to think about that case study and how that relates here to the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation and pH partitioning. Now, other body fluids in which pH differences from blood pH may cause trapping or reabsorption are the contents of the stomach and the small intestine, the breast milk, the aqueous humor of the eye, uh, vaginal secretion in female, prostatic secretion in male. These are all areas where we may see a pH partitioning effect depending on the nature of the drug. So if you were to look at the pH range of these different body fluids, you'd see, for example, the urine has a very large range, three pH units, that's three orders of magnitude, very large. Uh, the breast milk pH can range from slightly acidic to slightly basic. Um, the jejunum and the ileum uh, have basically slightly basic pH, uh, while the stomach contents, very acidic, the most acidic of them all. Uh, averaging at about pH of 2.0. Uh, prostatic secretion, uh, ranging from slightly acidic to about neutral, a little bit, a little bit basic. Um, and vaginal secretion, very acidic, right, ranging from 3.4 to 4.2. Um, and, and that's in part a protective mechanism uh, to reduce risk of infection, right? So the bacteria that gain access to the canal uh, you know, can't grow and, and thrive. Okay, so here we've got a very uh, interesting collection of various body fluids showing you that while um, we think of um, neutral pH for the blood or 7.2 to 7.4, uh, what we see is there are other compartments in the body where we can have very acidic environments. And because of that, uh, ionizable drugs, such as weak acids or weak bases, can get trapped in different places in the body. And of course, ultimately, we're trying to trap the drug into the urine so that it gets excreted and not accumulate to a toxic level. So, um, almost all of the several thousand drugs currently available can be, re can be arranged into about 70 groups. And you've just spent a lot of time talking about structure activity relationships uh, and various prototype drugs. So I'm going to go through this quickly. Um, we've spent some time in class talking about um, the drug approval process, going from the preclinical testing into the human clinical trials. Uh, and this timeline is showing you that about eight years of uh, preclinical and clinical testing with about 12 years of marketing rights. Uh, and we've talked in class how, you know, that eight-year length of time is variable depending on the drug, depending on how successfully uh, 
uh, the, the company is it getting through the various uh, human clinical trials once we've made it through preclinical testing. We talked about preclinical testing and the role of in vitro and in vivo experiments there. Uh, and in human clinical trials, we talked about the four phases. So this slide is kind of a summary of what we've discussed. Again, uh, showing you that, uh, you know, going from concept to uh, marketed drug is a multiple year process involving a lot of people, and once the drug is on the market, uh, involving the continuous surveillance of the drug. Of course, once the patent for the drug expires, then we have generics that become available, and those generics are, um, in order to be approved by the FDA for sale, must demonstrate to the FDA, those, those generic companies, that uh, the drug that they've, that they've synthesized is equivalent to the brand in terms of its composition and its mechanism. Okay, so um, after 20 years of patent protection, uh, the more expensive brand drug tends to get um, less prescribed, and the more affordable generic drug tends to be prescribed more. Although that's not always the case, uh, that tends to be what happens. Okay, so it looks like we've made it to the end of this uh, slide set. And um, again, I decided to archive this talk uh, because I hadn't covered this particular slide set in class. Uh, we definitely did cover parts of it, uh, but here it is. Uh, hopefully you found it uh, helpful in some way uh, to uh, enhancing your learning experience. Um, so I wish you well in your journey through the chapter one and chapter two material. Uh, and we will meet again shortly in class and continue our discussion uh, as we progress now through Chapter 2.